I'd now like to uh, welcome to the stage Scott Sandens. Thank you, Scott. Hello. All right, so why are we here today? We're worried about the direction that we're going in with technology. And I'd like to focus on three things. Te technology has actually been problematic for decades. And it's because of a core problem and that we actually can address that problem. So what's been going on? I think this is an important graph right here. Uh, if you look in the left, this is low skill. And on the right, you're at high skill. So decade after decade after decade, we've been creating more and more low skill jobs at the expense of middle class, uh, middle skill jobs, and also even at the expense of high skill jobs on the right. Uh, compensation actually tracked with productivity until around 1973 and then completely broke away. Now, if you look closer at this, at earnings, uh, men have actually now earning less than they were in 1973. Women have been making small gains. Now, if you break this apart by race, uh, the income distribution is entirely segregated. And uh, the black population is being completely left behind. And there's been no equalizing. If you break this down by age, the youngest, completely left behind. No growth. Seniors are doing the best. They're seeing the highest growth, largely because of Social Security being indexed to inflation. Now, because of all this, the entire bottom 80% has been seeing less of a share of the total pie. Only the top quintile, the top 20%, has been making gains. Now, this is a very interesting graph here. It really seems to track uh, the possible origin of inequality with the loss of collective bargaining power. As unions have fallen, inequality has increased. Now, a lot of people say that there's less to worry about with technology because prices are going down. Well, prices are going down for a good many things, but they're also going up for others. And if you look at the, the ones with the least amount of change, it's our most basic needs of food and housing. So where are we now? This is our wealth distribution in the US. Essentially, the bottom 90% has virtually nothing compared to everybody at, at the top. It's extremely unequal. In fact, because of this, the OECD recently reported that this inequality is actually affecting our economic growth. If we had not allowed it to increase, we'd actually have a trillion dollars more in GDP in the US right now. If we had decreased inequality, it could be over $20 trillion right now. This is also not something that we can fix by just giving, uh, giving, giving more to the bottom 10%. We actually have to increase the incomes for at least the bottom 40%. The way we work has been transformed. The Uber gig slash sharing economy has begun. And 40% of the workforce is now contingent labor. This is up from 30% just in 2005. 40 hour weeks have actually drifted back up to 47. People are working more than they used to. This is because of reduced insecurity. People are putting in more hours because they're concerned that they could lose their job if they don't. This also means less productivity. At the same time, even though we're clocking in, say, eight-hour days on average, people are, are reporting that they're working about five hours on average. So they're actually not even doing a full day. A lot of it's wasting. I like the way uh, David Graeber describes this. He calls it the bullshit jobs. I like this quote here. There's some strange alchemy no one can quite explain. The number of salaried paper pushers ultimately seems to expand, and more and more employees find themselves 
not unlike Soviet workers actually, working 40 or even 50 hour weeks on paper, but effectively working 15 hours, just as Keynes predicted, since the rest of their time is spent organizing or attending motivational seminars, updating their Facebook profiles, or downloading TV box sets. We've also got decreased security going on right now. The Federal Reserve surveyed 50,000 people and have found that 47% of the U.S. would not be able to handle an unexpected expense of $400 without borrowing or selling something. And more than 45 million people in the U.S. have needed food assistance every year since 2011. This is also affecting our democracy. An interesting, interesting report showed that those earning six figures are about 80% likely to vote. But if you're earning less than $15,000, you're about 30% likely to vote. And this has led to, uh, I believe, the Gillens and Page study that came out recently. And they found a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy for the ordinary American. So, this is where we are right now. The most common job in each state is truck drivers. It actually used to be secretaries back in the 80s, but uh, that was mostly replaced by software. So here we are. There's a lot of jobs involved and a lot of people dependent on those jobs as well. So we're looking at about 10 million jobs total that can be disrupted if anything happens to truck drivers. So what's next? the self-driving truck. It's already here. It's being tested right now. And uh, it may be a job killer, but it's actually going to save a lot of lives. It makes a lot of sense to have these on the road. The Google car that they've been testing has actually been very safe, even more safe on freeways. Now, a lot of estimates point towards a window centered around 2025. I believe the roadblock is mostly politics and not technology. The head of a policy at Google X, when asked about when Google cars will take the roads, quote, whenever California passes its operational regulations, we're just waiting for that. And driverless trucks are actually already being deployed. Uh, the CFO of Suncor, he's using these in uh, the oil sands in Canada, had this great quote. And you can see the reasoning for self-driving trucks as well. We'll take 800 people off our site. At an average salary of $200,000 per person, you can see the savings we're going to get from operations perspective. There's a lot of money involved in removing these wages and just keeping it. So what else is here? Deep learning algorithms have actually made some really impressive advances just in the last year. Deep learning is uh, trained by big data. And uh, just recently, it actually, a machine self-taught itself master level chess in just three days. It's also learned to play Atari 2600. It was only using pixels and points. It can now caption photographs. It can outperform humans in IQ tests above a bachelor's degree level, below master's degree. And deep learning is actually even being applied to self-driving vehicles. Well, what else can we do? We've got a lot of food service workers, and we already have the technology to replace a lot of this. More recently, we've got hamburger machines. We've also got robotic chefs. They can just be programmed to duplicate what a chef does. Now, the companies now need a lot less labor. As you can see in this photograph, this is the Ford Motor Company. Thousands and thousands of people. Tesla, it's a much smaller amount of people. But if you look in the background, there's a lot of robots back there. There's also companies now that need no labor. China is moving towards the Robot Replace Human program. They recently went from 650 workers to 60 workers, lower defects rates, and production went up. Sydney also has the world's first fully automated port terminal. So what do we do? I think we should think back about that link between inequality and unions. 
And I think that, that showed the loss of bargaining power is the problem. We lost that because of globalization. So is there another way of increasing bargaining power since we're not going away from globalization? We could give individuals the ability to, to decline jobs entirely. That's individual bargaining power versus collective bargaining power. So what happens when work is no longer required? Wages and salaries must then be high enough to attract workers. Where the required wage becomes too high, technology is welcome to take the job. There's less fear causing people to work 47 hours instead of 40 hours. There's no reason to fake your work and do eight hours instead of five. Jobs can adjust. You have the new ability to refuse those bullshit jobs. People don't want to do jobs that don't actually need to be done. And the thing about this is productivity goes up with every single one of those. The Uber economy and on-demand labor actually becomes a tool of empowerment. We can choose to control our hours. We can choose when you want to work. People can pursue their own work. Education actually becomes more voluntary. You can self-pursue it. You can take uh, massively online classes. And psychologically, when something is voluntary, commitment to task is increased. People would have more time to engage as citizens. They'd engage in political activism. It'd be easier to vote. They could volunteer more. They could parent more. They could do more care work. There's also less need for patents and copyrights. Of course, all of this assumes that everyone has enough income to live, despite not being in the labor force. How do we do that? We make enough a new starting point. Universal basic income. The idea is that no matter what, every individual gets the same amount as everyone else as an equal income floor set above the poverty level. In the US, it would be about $1,000 per month. In Europe, it could be about 1,000 euros. By definition, it could eliminate poverty, but it's only one effect. It's enough to refuse work, which is both its greatest strength and the cause of most concern. So what happens when everyone gets $1,000 per month? We no longer need programs like TAMP and SNAP. Welfare cliffs are eliminated. Welfare cliffs are when earning income actually reduces your total benefits. It actually makes less sense to work than it does not to. And this is because you get to keep everything. The basic income is never taken away. All type two errors are eliminated. There's no such thing as everybody as someone who should qualify and not qualifying, not getting it. Everyone gets it. All forms of unpaid work become uh, <laughs> recognized. So is this left or right? This is a great quote. Let's see if you can guess who said it. There's, the, there's then the important issue of security, of protection against risk common to all. Here, however, an important distinction has to be drawn between two conceptions of security. Limited security, which can be achieved for all, which is therefore no privilege, and absolute security, which in a free society cannot be achieved for all. The first of these is security against severe physical privation, the assurance of a given minimum of sustenance for all. And the second is the assurance of a given standard of life. Who said that? It was Friedrich Hayek, free market champion. Here's another quote. I'm now convinced the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by now widely discussed measure, based the guaranteed income. Martin Luther King. So there's support from this on the left and the right for good reasons. There's something each of them like. We've observed a lot of effects, actually, as well. And these are the common effects that we've seen. People don't stop working. They just change the way that they work. And they can even work more. Crime goes down. Health improves. Students go to school. People invest in their homes. There's no increase in alcohol and tobacco that we found. Savings go up. Debts go down. And entrepreneurs are born. And this is the important thing I really want to center on, is the entrepreneurial effect. Because these are actually very large effects in Namibia, in Liberia, in India, and in Kenya. We've seen this over and over again. People want to work, so they make their own work. 
Now, money lenders actually were worse off, so that's a negative effect for them. And there's also a shift from wage labor to self-employment, again. And some people may complain that there's a reduced dependency of women on men. And again, I don't think that's really a problem. How can we fund it? Well, we're already funding about half of it. And there's a lot of different ways that we can fund the rest of it. There's actually a lot of support for this as well. Very wide ranging. You can see capitalists, Marxists, CEOs, doctors. We might see it first in Switzerland. They're voting on it next year. There's experiments getting in the Netherlands, in Finland. Canada is looking at this strongly. Brazil already passed in the law, and Namibia is actually focusing on poverty. I see this as the new New Deal coalition. No one can agree on anything, but this is something that people can agree on. It's not the only change we need to make, but it will have the widest range of effects. So technology has been making things worse instead of better for decades, and we ain't seen nothing yet. It's also not tech's fault. It's ours. We have stubbornly refused to fix the primary flaw in our system. The not working isn't really an option. So no one has any real bargaining power outside of unions. And no one has any consumer buying power outside of employment. By introducing universal basic income, we can correct that flaw and consequently welcome technology to work for us instead of against us, freeing us all to seek purpose over survival and abundance over scarcity. Thank you.